Good day. My name is Paul Rudofsky. Today, the MIT Alumni Golf Association is presenting its third in a series of talks regarding the wonderful game of golf. And much to the surprise of most people, MIT's impact on the game. Our first talk was with Tom Doak, certainly among the great golf architects during the game's second golden age of architecture, which started about 25 years ago. Our second talk was with Steve Quinta, Quintabella, who's the Senior Director of Equipment Research and Testing at the USGA, where they focus on technology's impact on the game and are right in the middle of the current debates that are raging in that regard. So you ask about MIT connect connections. Well, Tom spent his freshman year at MIT some 45 years ago, prior to transferring to Cornell. And in terms of golf technology, one of the most important developments regarding golf equipment manufacturing was Titleist's use of X-ray technology starting in 1935 to inspect golf balls and in an idea conceived by two MIT alums, basically allowed them to QC quality control out any balls that weren't round and centered. Today's talk goes, uh, goes to, to what goes on behind the scenes to make major golfs happen. And 66 people thus far have served as USGA presidents since the USGA was founded in 1894. Two were MIT alums, William C. Founds Jr. in 1926 to 27, and William F. Nicholson Jr. in 80 to 81. And as we approach the start of the month of April, the game of golf focuses on the year's upcoming majors and important events. The first actually started this morning, the Augusta National Women's Amateur. The second starts tomorrow, the ANA Inspiration Championship at Mission Hills in the California desert. And the third, of course, will be the Masters Tournament starting April 8th. And as the season continues to unfold, MIT alum will again play a role. Our very own Kim Din, a member of the Alumni Golfers Association Board has qualified for and will be playing at the USGA's Women's Four Ball Championship being conducted starting April 24th at Marido Golf Club just north of Dallas. Kim, congratulations and best wishes for a fun event. We are super proud of you. To today's presentation and our pre presenter today is Mr. David Shag who began his career in 1973 at Houston Country Club before coming to the, con the country club that is Brookline's the country club as general manager and chief operating officer in 1987. The country club is the oldest country club in the United States and hosted the now famous 1913 US Open where Francis Twimet defeated Harry Varden and Ted, and Ted Ray since David arrived, the club has hosted the follow or will host next year, the following five events, the 1988 US Open, the 1995 Women's Amateur, the 1999 Ryder Cup matches, the 2013 US Amateur, and of course, we're currently scheduled to host next year's US Open. David is the past chairman of the National Club Association, as well as past president of the South Texas and New England chapters of the Club Managers Association of America. He established a course after coming to, to Boston, a course in private club management at Boston University in two, 2000, where he served as an adjunct professor for several years and on the board of advisors for 25 years. He's, he's also also a member of the USGA's Green Section Committee for 10 years. And I can tell you personally, based on my almost 13 years at Brookline, he may well have been the best uh, 
the best club general manager in the country. In October 2020, five months ago, he transitioned to his new role as senior advisor for the 2022 US Open. He's married to Lucy and they have two children, Greg and Sarah and their son-in-law, James. David, bring us behind the cat curtain. Tell us what goes on. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, Mona, Amy, Jeff, for the opportunity today and all the work that you put in behind the scenes to make this happen. Um, with that kind of introduction, uh, I transitioned to senior advisor because I turned 65 years old and I think it probably had come time in a pandemic and things going on that uh, it would be a wise time to transition. It's a couple of years before an open. I've been very lucky to be at one of the best clubs in the country and uh, I'm still happy that they've got a nice little glide path that I can remain involved with the club uh, through the 22 US Open. Uh, so with that, I would say with the years of working at the country club today, I'm going to talk to you about the, uh, uh, what it takes to host a major championship. And where I have focused on this has really been in the area of the contracts. Uh, I wanna talk about contractually what went on in these tournaments and what has evolved over time to give you insight behind the scenes into how these uh, tournaments are structured contractually and how they unfold uh, operationally. And so uh, I'll take you on this journey uh, at this time. And obviously there will be question and answers at the end of this. Uh, to give you a little bit of history with the Country Club, it has been, it's one of the five founding members of the United States Golf Association. It's hosted 16 USGA events, uh, which you see on the boards here that have been hung in the, uh, in the locker building. It also hosted a PGA event in 1999 called the Ryder Cup Matches. And so it's had a great deal of history about uh, uh, tournaments and golf within uh, 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 the country. And it's a great deal of reading uh, about it. I think probably Mark Frost captured it well with the greatest game ever played. So uh, an easy read, great information about 1913 and Francis Wiemetz win, but it carries on in time here for what we do as a club. And as a club, we were founded on horse racing, not on golf. Founded in 1882, but it wasn't until 1893 that golf came along. And it was designed the first six holes by members then nine holes, and then we had 18 and then 27. We acquired parcels of farmland over time to be able to develop the, uh, uh, the facility and the golf that came on later on. Most people ask when it comes to major championships, why would you host a major championship? Most people think it's money. Uh, that's not the case. And I'll talk to you about many of the categories today, uh, but this is looking over hole number 12 uh, it's a short par three downhill recently restored by Gil Hans. Uh, and of our 27 holes, we have a composite course using the holes on the property to come up with a championship configuration. When we play the open next year, it will be the first time that we've brought this hole number 12 into play. Um, and we've eliminated hole number four and on the main course. So, uh, uh, Gil Hans, you'll see, is our golf course architect, but there are many reasons why you host a major championship. One, obviously, is the good of the game, and you've heard this before. People talk about, well, you want to support the game. It grows the game by hosting championships, and uh, it certainly does. In, in a private club, in an environment where people get pretty comfortable with their golf course and their environment, you can imagine there are a number of people that would prefer we not host a major championship. It's disruptive. Uh, it is, uh, uh, involves uh, investments in the infrastructure and it just takes time away from members and their enjoyment. Uh, those would be the people that look at the glass uh, half empty. And, but when it comes to the good of the game and what you do, you will find that for us, there are many other reasons why and for most clubs and most operations other than just money. One of them, of course, is golf course improvements. Many golf courses sit there for a period of time without the, in, uh, the investment into the asset 
to make sure that it's staying current, not only with the game, but bunkers age and, and, and golf cart paths and other things that need to be updated, drainage uh, that goes on. And usually when you host a major championship, your focus comes in on what do you need to do with the golf course. Associations like United States Golf Association and the PGA are going to be very quick to tell you, we'll take the golf course exactly the way it is. They say that because they're very smart in the fact that many members will want to make improvements to the course. And obviously there's money behind that. And so an association backs off, says, we'll take it the way it is. And then any improvements that you make, you really are funding yourself. But when you get golf course architects, and Reese Jones was our golf course architect from 1985 to um, uh, mid-90s. And then uh, we had uh, Ben Crenshaw come in with Bill Coor for a period of time. And then Gil Hans came in after the Ryder Cup matches. So Gil came on in the around 2003, 4, and has been our golf course architect since. Uh, he's one of the best in the country or in the world. He has an ability to uh, modify golf courses, uh, uh, retain the history of the golf course, but particularly get in front of members and be able to answer to the, uh, the issues at hand, the investments that need to be made. Uh, so a, a USGA will say they'll take the golf course the way it is. They do prepare a Bible about two years in advance. And it's an agronomic Bible. It's something that we use with the ground superintendent and crews and with specialists from the USGA. And it's how you start grooming the golf course two years out and one year out so that you're ready to roll when it comes to the year of the championship. But those costs are borne by the club, by the host site. And it was interesting in 19 or after the Marion uh, U.S. Open. A few years afterwards, we were in the market. We were talking with uh, people that hosted championships, and I'll never forget the conversation with the treasurer from Marion just saying, one thing you want to control is that all the hand low handicap golfers are going to want many improvements to the golf course and spend a lot of money on it, and it's money you really don't have, so be careful. And sure enough, we get into it now. We're making improvements, but it's not just low handicap golfers. It's also individuals that really look at the course, the age that's gone on with it and what we need to do to stay current. And so it's been an investment over time, but Gil Hans has led that effort for us. And it's a benefit to the members in the long run, not just the championship. We exist in a small community called Brookline. And so for us, where we pay our taxes and where we have a butters and where we are subjected to the government of Brookline and what goes on for us, maintaining a very good relationship with the town is important, not just for championships, but in between. But when it comes to major championships, uh, you need that local commu uh, community behind you, not just for uh, fire, police, uh, public services, uh, town employees that need to, uh, permitting for all sorts of things that go on, but you need a good working relationship with the local community. And that isn't something that just happens around the championship. It's something that you have to pay attention to over a long period of time. We found in 1997, prior to the Ryder Cup matches, um, that the town wanted to form what was called a community partnership committee, and they did. And it was a group of town citizens along with the country club and a couple members uh, of the PGA that we would meet regularly on things that we could do for the local community, for people that couldn't get tickets, couldn't get into the championship uh, or could be volunteers or whatever it might be that we would do. And it was an exercise in the beginning. There were many perceptions about a private club and many misunderstandings about a USGA uh, or excuse me, at this time was the PGA. But in the end, after the tournament, it was a uh, community partnership of about 20 people and everybody grew very friendly and they all wanted the championship to come out successfully. We wanted to be able to maintain a great re relationship in the future. And this little picture I have behind me that uh, is green and outlined, it's for youth in the town of Brookline. After the championship uh, in 99, we started a Brookline Youth Fund with $500,000. And today it's over a million dollars. We host a golf event for charitable purposes for this youth fund where people around the world can uh, play the club course and contribute 
to this fund. And now we're giving out grants to uh, underprivileged children in the town of Brookline to the tune of 60 to 75,000 a year. So it was an initiative that came out of this that stands a lot of, of community relationship building and goodwill that the club stands to benefit from. And when it comes to future championships, it makes it easier to host them. This presentation I put together a couple of years ago for a group of managers in New Zealand and Australia. So please excuse the fact that I got the Reserve Bank of New Zealand on here, but many people think hosting major championships all about money. And I don't want to uh, divert that attention too much. Yes, it uh, definitely involves money, but that's not the sole reason that you get into uh, when you get into a major championship. And with something like a US Open coming in or a Ryder Cup match, it'll bring 150 million more, 175 million into a local economy. And when it does, it's usually inuring to the benefit of the state or Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It's inuring to the city of Boston. But when it comes to the town of Brookline, they don't see those type of numbers. So having a community partnership and working in ways that things can inure to the benefit of the local committee or community is very important. Uh, but for us, obviously, money is one of the factors that we consider when it comes to hosting it. Obviously, as a private club, we need members over time. We've been very fortunate to have a, a full membership for uh, over a century. And yet, for us, when we look at it, we have 1,300 members, probably we turn over 40 a year. So it's been 20 years since we've hosted a real major championship. That's 800 new members over 20 years that are members now of this country club that did not experience the Ryder Cup matches or the 88 US Open. So for us, when we look at it, a major championship brings the community together, the membership community. They get to know each other more. Uh, people today are hearing stories from members about what went on during these championships and how exciting they were. And for us as a local community and as a club, it's, it really strengthens the pool of future members and it strengthens the relationship between members that exist today. How do you get an invitation for a major championship? Well, a lot of it rests with relationship building, being involved with the association. I am going to talk a little bit today about how we might have veered from that a little bit over time. Uh, we were awarded the 1982 US Amateur and we had the 1988 US Open. Uh, for many of you, we then hosted the 1995 Women's Amateur. But many of you don't realize that we were asked to host the US Open in 1995 and the country club elected not to. And I'll explain reasons why later, but the, uh, that was the centennial for the USGA. And we just found that event to be so big at the time that uh, we elected not to. And so we were awarded the women's amateur, which by the way, to me was one of the best championships I've ever uh, uh, managed and been involved with. Um, but then we went to one of their competitors because at the time in 1994, 95, the Ryder Cup matches were becoming very popular, but also uh, Tiger Woods had stimulated the world of golf. And that seemed to us to be a pretty exciting event. And uh, so we ended up expressing interest in it. But it's about relationship building. At that time in 99, we veered away from the USGA and we went with a competitor. So you'll see when we get to 2013, which was the 100th anniversary of Francis Wiemet's win, where we wanted an open, we didn't get one. We got a US Amateur, a great event. Great event for golf, great event for the country club. And it certainly led to the 19 or the 2022 US Open, but there's more history and background for me to give you there. The Places that people want to go today are not just in private clubs, it's interested in public facilities as well. And when you look at some of these, they can truly host a major championship with more land and more access uh, easier.
for associations to get into uh, than something like Marion or the Country Club, which normally limit the size and the access to the facility. Whereas you can go to a Beth Page, a Chambers Bay, an Aaron Hills, uh, a Pebble Beach, and it certainly opens it up, but it also opens it up to public facilities so that they're not just held at private clubs, uh, which is very important for the balance of golf. Much of what goes on with our relationship with the USGA and making sure that we remain involved with them and, and part of their family, so to speak, is that they have sponsors or partners that they ally themselves with. And they're very much involved with uh, the dollars that are spent on major championships and the support they get for all of their championships across the board. They just uh, added Century that's on there. But that does influence major championships. It influences how it's structured, how the site map is determined, and it certainly influences the amount of money that the USGA is able to make off from uh, a championship. For many people today, you think about the type of money that a US Open makes and, um, and people read about Fox News, Fox Sports, and the amount of money that was generated in a deal several years ago. Uh, for the United States Golf Association, the US Open generates the funds that supports all their other championships. So although they make a profit off their revenue and expense when it comes to uh, uh, the US Open, that money is used for their other major championships. And so is the money that they get from advertising or from uh, uh, the news networks. So something like Fox, Fox Sports in the agreement at 93 million a year that came out in 2013, uh, that compared to the time 37 million a year they were getting from NBC. And many of you are certainly aware that uh, it didn't work out the way they had hoped with Fox Sports. NBC has gone back in and taken over in that regard, but there is no money that comes from the, uh, from the news networks and the coverage, the sport networks on this to go to host sites. Many questions come up in that regard, particularly from local communities and others, but that really inures to the benefit of the USGA, as does the profit from a US Open, but most of their other championships basically, uh, host sites are really struggling to break even, and USGA underwrites a great deal of what goes on with the other major championships. So I would like to take you back in time contractually to these four events and let you know a little bit behind the scenes on how it has evolved over time. The contract in, for the 1988 US Open was signed in 1985, I believe was the year. And at that time, golf was different. They were coming to a very sports oriented area like the city of Boston. And the way the USGA operated was that they were responsible for processing the entries and the qualifiers conducting the championship, providing rule books and scorecards, providing the prize money for the winners, providing advisory services, and they were basically a guest at the country club. That's the way the contract was written in 1984-85. What that meant as a, as a club, and this was typical of other clubs that were hosting at the same time, is that the club was responsible for all the risk of revenue and expense. So the club had to organize the administration and management of a major championship, hire a director, hire a team of people to work with the director, provide and sell all the admission tickets, prepare the golf course in the uh, practice areas, provide security and gallery control, Obviously security was different in 1988, but all of it had to be provided and organized by the host site, the club. The club had to secure the hotels and arrange all transportation for players, media, and USGA. It had to organize transportation and parking for spectators. It had to provide all the press facilities and what was required inside for the press to come in and cover the open. The club had to provide all the medical the comfort stations, golf carts, food and beverage for spectators and for corporate. Uh, the club provided, sold uh, corporate hospitality. 
And again, at the time in 1988, we had sold out corporate hospitality and space on site, and it was the largest corporate hospitality sell to date for the USGA. But it was the type of market we were in, and we were in Boston. It worked. But we were responsible for programs. That was a thing of the past. The course map, public scoring, security communications. And at the time, like anything you do in private clubs, you form a committee if there's ever a challenge. And so we had an ambiance committee and a group that protected the brand and the image of the club because outside of the ropes, the USGA was relying on the host site to make sure that they managed the event. So we had a group that we paid attention to the look and the style and what went on outside the ropes. A much different world then. And I must say, when it came to food and beverage, and I recall in 1988, at the time, no one had any idea how many people we'd get for practice rounds because uh, leading up to it at other host sites, not many people came to practice rounds. Uh, we got caught off guard where we were estimating seven to 9,000 people on Monday, the first of the practice rounds. I think we ended up with 15,000. And the front page of the Boston Globe was all about waiting over an hour for a lemonade and a Coke. And so we only opened about half of the uh, concession stands on site and quickly uh, reverse that to open double that amount the next day. But at the time you couldn't predict how many people would show. So from us in a contractual arrangement, and this gives you a great deal of insight behind the scenes, food and beverage, the club inured 100% of any profit went to the club. Program sales, 12%, 12.5% of advertising for the program would go to the USGA. The rest of any profit you made off the program was for you. Um, Parking, whatever you were able to arrange for parking and charge for it, 100% would go to the club. In those days, merchandise was not even in the contract. And you've got to go back now. This is 35 years. Most clubs, the professionals, the golf pros, own the pro shop. That isn't the way it exists necessarily today. The trend's been far from that. Usually the club owns it. At that time, Don Callahan, our golf pro, was very kind in renegotiating his contract two to three times because we were floored by the amount of merchandise that was flowing through that pro shop. Just something that wasn't even on the contract or understood at the time by the USGA. It was just, hey, whatever merchandise money you can make, make it. Tickets, 65% would be with USGA, 35% with TCC, and corporate sales was 20% of the net. So here's a summary of what we did in 1988. We publicized this review of revenue and expense for the club. And we represented a loss at the time of 644,000. That was after a number of improvements and things we had to do to prepare for the championship. It's not a reflection that the profit versus expense here or revenue versus expense areas weren't managed well. We had a team of people that did a great job with it. But there was a lot of preparation, as you can see in one of those lines down there, grounds and golf course preparation, almost 3 million. There was a lot that went into it after 25 years to get ready for an, for an open. This is what showed up. As soon as we displayed it to the membership, this showed up in the front page of the Boston Globe that the country club loses 644,000 on the US Open in June. That created quite a furor among our members when they looked at it, they all thinking that they made money off from it. And once we represented revenue and expense, and this could be another session unto itself with everybody, but bottom line is when we got done polishing up our numbers, this is how it was represented. And members looked at it as how could you lose money? We had to do a great deal of communication after that. Also for all of you to recognize, most people watch these major championships and they see it from a television perspective, or they see it once they get a ticket and they're admitted on site. But the way I like to be able to represent the preparation of a championship and then the restoration following is much like a hurricane. If any of you have been through it, and I lived 13 years in Houston, so I was through a couple, but basically it's a storm, it's winds that blow one direction and in a high velocity and leads up to the tournament itself. The tournament itself is the eye of the storm, blue skies, hopefully you have good weather, but things settle in. And then post tournament, it's an equal and opposite direction for the wind, 
it's the same thing on site where you build everything up, everything gets ripped down and taken off site. And you've got to hold on to your assets to make sure that what you have remains at the club that isn't uh, transportable. So it's something that truly was underestimated by me. I'd never been through a major championship. I underestimated the amount of work in the restoration after the championship, since we hadn't done one in 25 years, there were no records. And at the time it was one that for communication purposes, we communicated once a month in a written document to members. That wouldn't exist today, obviously. Everyone expects to hear yesterday uh, what's going on. Uh, so restoration was something we could have spent more time educating members. It was a big program. The tournament was in June. Our busier months tend to go on through the summer months and we had a lot of restoration going on. It was a drought afterwards. We had to continue to nurture the grass and the facilities. And so it was a longer hangover for the membership in 1988. And we learned from that particular experience, but between the loss and restoration, members came out of 88 going, I wonder if hosting major championships are really worth it. So as I mentioned earlier in 1995, the year of the 100th anniversary USGA, uh, they had explored the possibility of us hosting an open. We weren't ready. Not that we didn't support the USGA as an organization. We weren't ready for another major event with the type of board that we had and leadership in the time. Uh, so we declined the open and we were awarded the women's amateur so that we could host something to celebrate the centennial, centennial USGA, a great event. Basically for us, we broke even on the women's amateur. And that's with a number of members we called angels that contributed some money to be able to help us get to that break even status. 135 contestants, 500 volunteers, 500 to 1,000 spectators. But one of the most rewarding championships to do. It's all about family, coaches, brothers, sisters, parents, and the competitors. And to me, it was probably one of the most rewarding experiences of all the championships I've been involved with. Uh, you do a lot of work for it, uh, but it's one that uh, is well worth it. And your goal is simply to break even. So then in our, in our time away from the USGA a little bit, uh, we thought hosting the Ryder Cup would be a great idea. And so at the time we reached out, this was 1995, 96, we reached out to the PGA and expressed interest. And so uh, the head of the PGA at the time um, said, it's a great idea. Why don't you come down? We'll talk about it. So our golf chairman flew down to Florida and basically played a round of golf with the director of the PGA, Mr. Autry. And at the end of it, they shook hands and said, this sounds like we should try to make this happen in 1999. So then it was a simple handshake. Hopefully you can see the humor in this, although a lot's gone on in two years since I had this up for another move, but I thought it still brings a little humor to us. Uh, but a simple handshake was something that without building big relationships over time, it was a handshake around a golf and it was an expression of interest. After that, two parties started working together on a, uh, on a contract for us to be able to host the Ryder Cup matches. The agreement for the Ryder Cup matches is that uh, the PGA would staff, the staff they needed to run it. They would control all revenue and expense. They held the uh, checkbook. And that in the end, there wasn't really a partnership between the two parties, but in the end, we would split the profits from the championship and that the club would be protected from a loss. We might come up with very little money, but we wouldn't lose money. And that at the time we would focus on community partnership efforts. That is what we did. A much different agreement. And it was different because we were accustomed to running championships up until this point. So for the country club's mentality, we set our own organizational chart and the USGA had their staff and organizational chart and there was a little competition between the two for us to understand. We were trying to influence the outcome and the brand of the country club, 
they obviously, it was their championship, their Ryder Cup matches, and they had ideas and things they wanted to do for it. So a uh, great group of people. We worked on a successful championship together. Uh, it certainly exceeded any of our expectations. The, we were sold out two years in advance on corporate tents. Now, again, you're back in 1997 at this time, and uh, the world of golf was very popular. The economy was strong. Everything was going the right direction. So corporate sales ended up sold out a couple of years in advance. 200 tables at $50,000 a table, and we had a surplus of people waiting to get more tables, and we couldn't fit it onto our campus. We had maximized the site map and corporate hospitality maximized the way it was. Um, in the end, I won't share all the numbers with you, obviously, uh, but in the end, the 1999 Ryder Cup matches made a significant profit and the profit was divided between the PGA and the country club. Uh, at that time, for many of you, the, P the Ryder Cup matches did not contribute anything to players. And in that particular year, players started to bring it up because it was becoming quite evident that the money behind and the interest behind this match and people playing for their countries is very important, but also inuring some of that money into other benefits was important as well. And so today it has evolved into contributions to charities and other things that go on through the PGA and working with the players and, and uh, coming up with ways in which it can, inure, it can inure to other benefits. But at this time it didn't exist with that contract, et cetera. I took out some of the numbers. I didn't want anyone to get upset with me, but tickets, this is the distribution of tickets between the PGA and the uh, British PGA um, and corporate tents and tables and TCC members and what we gave to charities. That were about two thirds of the tickets that totaled up to 32,000. About a third of it went into public for people to be able to buy tickets to get into the championship. Many of the people that were represented here and were coming to it represented public anyway, but you know, for sale purposes, that's where it stood. So we sold in the area 32,000 uh, tickets. You have additional workers and volunteers in the area of about 7,500 in addition to this. So you're probably 40,000 people a day on campus during one of these major championships. An interesting bit of trivia for you to understand. It's not unusual when you host a major championship that the staff that are there get a chance to buy tickets. They don't get them for free, but they get a chance to buy tickets. And what we did is we had little gifts we gave the staff two years out, a year out, but we did extend a privilege to the staff to be able to buy tickets. But what we learned from the Ryder Cup matches at Oak Hill in Rochester, New York, is that there was so much money being offered for tickets at the time, people that were making minimum wage were making a half a year or more salary by selling the tickets they bought from the club. We didn't want that to happen. So we set up a program where employees were given the opportunity to buy tickets, a limited number, but we also made it very clear that if anybody abused the privilege, we would prosecute them but if they weren't going to use their tickets, we would buy them back at face value before we distributed them. It was like a bonus and it was very effective. We spent quite a bit of money on it. A number of people that didn't want the tickets at the time that would have been lured uh, into some type of environment of, of scalping or whatever could happen, we offered a buyback. It worked very successfully for us. And then obviously at the end of a championship, it's not unusual to come up with some type of small stipend or something for staff that have contributed uh, for a championship. I learned in 1988 that I allowed the bonus consideration to go in a couple months after the tournament. That was much too soon. You wanna hold it off until all restoration's done, which takes several months. So in something in bonus consideration, I learned a lot in 88, so in 99 positioned ourselves pretty well when it came to benefiting the staff. This was a bone of contention from 1999. Many of you may have read about this in uh, publications, but 
basically we had a backlog of interest in corporate tables for this championship. So the town of Brookline, the country club and the PGA worked on an arrangement where we would build a tent on Putterham Golf Course, which is the adjacent municipal golf course to us. People could walk from there right to the country club. We would build a tent, sell 100 tables at 50,000 each, and the first three million in profit would be distributed to the town of Brookline. And that's exactly what happened. The unfortunate part of it is that it was perceived that the town had manipulated uh, uh, profits or program that should have inured to the PGA uh, chain or the Ryder Cup matches. Uh, so either way, it was one that from the country club and the town of Brookline's perception, it was very good. It was not taking away from the championship. We had a successful championship. We were sold out. We were able at the time, because of the way the economy was, to raise additional funds, get people into a tent who thoroughly enjoyed the championship, came in, and the money inured to the town of Brookline. Most of the money, like that 150 million I referred to earlier that goes into the state or city, goes to them. It doesn't go to the local community. This was a great way for us at a time where golf was thriving for us to be able to help the town of Brookline. Either way, it left a little bad blood. We were supposed to host the 2005 PGA Championship. Normally, you would host the PGA Championship, which is smaller, and you'd earn your colors by hosting it. Then you'd get the Ryder Cup afterwards, much like hosting a US Amateur first, proving yourself, and then getting an Open later. Um, the way we signed the contract was the reverse. And so at the end of 1999, uh, there were many reasons why both the PGA and the country club decided it may be best that this championship go to another community. So Baltus Rawl Golf Club is the one that ended up with 2005 championship and not the country club. So after this 1999 Ryder Cup match, we wanted to focus on the USGA and our relationship with them. We had uh, drifted a bit. We got back involved with them. And 2013 represented the 100th anniversary of Francis Wiemet's win. So we went to the USGA. They remembered the fact that we didn't want the Open in 95. They also remembered the fact that we took on the PGA Ryder Cup matches. And so we were awarded the U.S. Amateur in 2013, a wonderful event. We were very fortunate to get it. Uh, we were interested first in the Open, next in the Walker Cup. The USGA moves the Walker Cup now to facilities that really can't host an Open necessarily. They're smaller, but great venues. And the Curtis Cup was coming here and there was a relationship with the Curtis uh, sisters here and at Essex County Club, uh, either way, uh, the Essex County Club took the Curtis Cup, and we were fortunate to have the U.S. Amateur. Great event. Matt Fitzpatrick won it with his brother on the bag, and it was a great piece of history for us. Uh, the Compared to the Women's Amateur in 1995, uh, we lost money on the U.S. Amateur. It's a much bigger undertaking. It's got double the number of contestants, uh, double the number of volunteers, and many more spectators than what you would have with a women's amateur at this at that time anyway in today's world it may be very similar uh, but that was also 2013 was the year of the uh, marathon bombing and so our event was in august the marathon bombing was in april this was a televised event open to the public uh, advertised and local security branches etc uh, were very tight and so we ended up spending significantly more on something we totally had hadn't predicted. How could you? It was something as horrible as the event that went on and then to have it impact us, it was unpredictable, but it cost us significantly at that time. But that didn't detract from the fact that the amateur was a wonderful event, great sporting event, well supported by uh, people in the area. Uh, and uh, I can tell you from running events like this, um, it was harder to run a U.S. Amateur than it's to run a Ryder Cup match or a U.S. Open. Those events, you build infrastructure and staffing at many different levels. 
you don't have the many different levels between you and what actually happens. So in these amateur level events, you have all hands on deck with your department heads and people working very hard to pull it off. But I got to tell you, it is most gratifying by the end of it. And so for us, we were able to execute a great US amateur. Uh, and Mike Davis nodded at the time and felt that uh, the course and the community, the backing that was going on, uh, their feeling with the town of Brookline all went well in 2013. So uh, we looked at it and the USGA did and it lined up for us to have a US Open in 2022. But today, there are two agreements. It's not just with the country club, there's one with the local community, a written contract with the local community. So Brookline signs an agreement with the USGA on services they'll provide and what they'll get for it. And they sign a rental agreement with us. And the rental agreement, basically, I wanna show you the reverse of what we did in 1988. Here's what the US Open uh, staff does and their obligations contractually to host a major championship. They run it all. It doesn't make sense for them to go to different host sites every year and educate volunteers on how to run a major championship. They take it on. They know better by using their vendors and their staff year after year that they can run it better that way. It makes great sense. Totally different than the way it used to be. So they organize and run everything here that you see. And for the country club, Basically, again, back to course, we're responsible for the golf course and the competition and all the investment into it. Um, we're rented as a property. We're basically guests on our own site. And we're the advisors to the USGA on local knowledge. They run it, but we're there as local knowledge. So a total reverse from what I showed you in 88. And in today's world, it's basically a rental agreement. And the people that are involved, in fact, we just opened up to our membership, the volunteer effort, and have over a thousand people all registered for volunteering for the open. There's just great interest in the city of Boston and not just with our membership that uh, support major, champ major uh, sporting events. The contract for 2022 is different. They have a flat rental fee that goes to the host site. You share in a small percentage on tickets and a small percentage on merchandise. A little larger percentage you share in on corporate because they expect you to make an effort to help sell corporate. And then if you host golf events at your site, you're able to make the money off from those golf events at that time. Uh, we don't normally host outside golf events or do that. Some, some facilities do golf events every Monday or Thursday, whatever. We've never done that, but we did it for the amateur because we had to raise money for the amateur and we've been doing it for the open in an effort to uh, offset the costs that involved for us behind the scenes for shutting down facilities and things. So uh, we do host some golf events. We don't uh, anticipate that going on post open. And then obviously we do not share in the television broadcast revenue. And to give you a little insight for us to host uh, a golf event, if you wanna use our main course, which is a main 18, we have 27 holes. If you take the main 18, it's 75,000 for 72 golfers. And if you go over 72 golfers, it's 1100 per person up to 112 golfers. If you like the championship course, it's 125,000 for 72 golfers and it's 1400 a golfer above that. Um, and we take about four to six of those a year and we've sold out each year. We're sold out this year and we'll only take a couple next year and then uh, we'll have to make a decision after that. But there is interest in golfers playing uh, championship sites. So for us hosting these major events, I explained a number of the reasons. I've gone through the contracts. I've shown you some of the dollars and feelings behind it. But it's also in making the history that's involved. Uh, and so where you look at this and Curtis Strain's a uh, uh, playoff that came on the Monday after uh, the, uh, well, Sunday night, there was a playoff determined and he and Nick Faldo went into a playoff on Monday morning. I can tell you my heart sank on Sunday evening when all of a sudden we had to regroup. We already had plans in place in case there was a playoff, but everybody hoped there wouldn't be. And it came down to the final putt on the 18th green. And next thing you know, we got a playoff the next day. I can tell you, we were scrambling for 24 hours, making sure that we were staffed, things were in place and we were ready to go. No one knew how many people we would get. 
And we had between 12 and 15,000 people that showed up for a playoff hole the next day. Amazing number of people that would come out uh, on the following day. And most of you have read about the history of the Ryder Cup matches and the celebrations that went on. Uh, that could be another presentation just to talk to you about the experiences behind the scenes of what went on during the celebrations and things that happened here. It was uh, phenomenal. But you can see we really got some great history at the country club and, and uh, competitors that have won championships here. And so we've been very fortunate. So for us, when we look to the future and we look at 2022, uh, it's an opportunity to continue that history. And so we're working, we are working feverishly behind the scenes now. We anticipate that once it's done at Torrey Pines, the world turns to look at the country club and we are really ready and set for that tournament in 2022. We hope the pandemic's behind us. We hope that many spectators can come obviously and enjoy what used to be enjoyed for major championships. But with that said, I can't thank you enough for the opportunity to talk to you about this behind the scenes, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thanks so much, David. Just a really great and comprehensive look at uh, major championships at the country club and what it takes uh, to run one. So really interesting. And we've gotten a few questions, and uh, please, for the uh, participants, uh, add more to the chat uh, or to the uh, Q&A portion. Um, uh, really excited about the U.S. Open next year at the Country Club. Does TCC have any plans or desire to host a U.S. Women's Open? Uh, very good question. Um, I think that what you would find with the uh, United States Golf Association is they always wait until they see what goes on at each of the championships to make sure that things go well with the community, well with the club. They want to make sure that they're protected in what happens down the road. Uh, and the USGA and the Country Club and Brookline, the town of Brookline, have all put a great deal of effort into this right now. I think the USGA feels good about where they are with the, uh, the Country Club and the Country Club hosting uh, events in the future. Uh, the Women's Open is definitely one that's on the table for us. You will find when the United States Golf Association, they're really trying to uh, represent the Women's Open in, at clubs and facilities that would host a Men's Open. Uh, so uh, uh, it's in their court for them to decide, but we are definitely interested in hosting future championships. Women's Open would be one that would be, be an honor to have come here to the country club. Uh, so would obviously another U.S. Open. They tend to look at maybe their rotation being a little tighter in the future with the USGA, but they like going to older style clubs. We're fortunate that uh, Boston supports championships like this. We'd like to be part of it. And I will say, because I've been involved with amateurs, if we did a junior girls amateur or a junior boys amateur, I think it would be a thrilling event to host at the country club. Fantastic. Uh, we have another question from a former uh, employee of the country club, Michael Shafir. He uh, was on the wait staff under uh, Kirsten LeCount uh, and was captain of the Brookline high school golf team, as he wants to point out. Uh, so his question is, has, uh, the country club ever considered, uh, adopting the British model where, uh, private clubs open their tee sheets to public, uh, play or visitors in a limited fashion? Mike, great question. And if you come back in a Brookline, I want to come by and say hi, do so. Uh, Kristen LeCount is now the general manager of the country club. She took my role. Uh, she was eight years as the AGM and would love to see you. So Mike, that's a great question. And I think that uh, from our perspective, uh, we're a private club. We're governed as a private club by the Internal Revenue Service. And there are restrictions that we can do and, and have that are different in the United States than they are overseas. So there are restrictions that tie us as a, uh, as a private club that we have to be uh, careful with. Um, but with that said, I'd equally say that for us, we're no longer the type of club that sits there quietly in the background, hoping no one recognizes that we exist and that we only inure to the benefit of the membership. I think that the country club has done an incredible job at reaching out to the local community. 
in many different ways, not just uh, what I uh, uh, talked to you as an example of Brookline Youth Fund and the charitable event we do each year. We're very much involved with the local community, supporting them with scholarship programs, uh, supporting the We Met Foundation in the state of Massachusetts with scholarship money, um, and hosting events for the We Met Foundation, hosting events here for the Mass Golf Association. Uh, so we do try to um, open up more than what would have been represented in the past. I think that uh, uh, we do things for the local community, uh, junior programs, as well as teenage center, things like that. We've got a long list of things that we work with the community on to make sure that we're a good citizen and what we do. But there are further restrictions that don't allow us to open up to general public on a regular basis. Yeah, uh, a somewhat related question. Um, did you get much pushback from the membership when you decided to host uh, public events on Mondays? The, uh, well, no doubt that Golf and, you know, let's face it with the pandemic going on, golf is up 30 to 40% in most facilities that I talk to across the country. Everybody wants to be outside. And so, and I suspect this year, at least in the New England area, although people are anxious about the vaccines and hoping to get back to what you consider normal, uh, there's still be mask wearing and there's still going to be restrictions and we're still going to be in a pandemic when it comes this fall. And I'm no member of the CDC, but uh, you do look at it as we are going to have a lot of golf play. And we went to tea times as a result. We've never had tea times at the country club. We have them now because we need to structure what goes on because golf play is up. And we do anticipate that golf play will remain up in this particular year. Uh, with that, you have people that are trying to get on the course that want to enjoy it. And anytime we have, whether it's a member event that displaces them or it's an outside event that displaces them, there are people that just want to come out and play casual golf and they're restricted at times. So for us, yes, it is an issue. We have to communicate more. We've got to get people to understand when and how and what we're doing and why uh, to help deflect that. But you're right, there are those people that look at it and just wonder why we would take over a course. And, you know, we support the uh, local high school boys and girls golf teams. They both play here and compete here, which Mike was on. And, and it's a great effort to be able to come out here. Members, they see the kids and they know what's going on. There's no problem with that. It's usually these one-offs when we get into major championships that create more of an issue. Yeah, and related to that uh, question from uh, Stuart, um, you talked a lot about the financial um, implications after a championship, but what about the course implications? So what's the impact on the greens? How long until uh, members can have their courses back? Great, great question. You know, there is as much time that goes into planning the restoration program today th than there is for planning the championship. What you do following that championship is critical. Now, Mostly, Stuart, from tee to green, it's protected. And people, uh, it's only the players that are inside the ropes and caddies and people that are following them along uh, closely to the ropes. But the least amount of damage is usually from tee to green. It's outside the ropes that you uh, occur most of the damage. And for us, it could occur on other greens that are on the course that are not in use for the championship, other fairways, other tees that get built over for whatever purpose, roads that get put up that need to be removed. So the program that we have in place is, uh, and we have 27 total holes, we'll be on that championship course for the entire year of 2022. So although the championship's over on June 19th, uh, our other alternative golf course holes won't be in play until the following year. Uh, because it takes time for us to get all of the USGA staging and equipment off site. That's usually mid August to late August. So we go into planting programs about that time and things that go on. You hope to have a late fall and that you've got as much growth in the property as possible uh, so that you can open all 27 in the spring. So there is a lag time to it, but to be truthful with you, Stuart, as you look at it right now, the USGA, has a playoff that occurs the Sunday night. They no longer go to the Monday on the playoff. So for us, we're looking at it as we uh, uh, 
would like to reopen and plan to reopen our golf course and probably our clubhouse on a limited basis on the Saturday following the championship. There's a lot of chaos still going on on site, but we can get people out there starting to play um, uh, soon thereafter because the championship course is usually in very good shape. Great, thank you. I have uh, two last questions. Um, one is from Kenneth. Uh, do you feel the proportion of major events held in classic venues like the Country Club, uh, Wing Foot from the US Open last year um, versus some of the newer courses? So Aaron Hills, Chambers Bay. Do you feel it's kind of the right balance? You know, it's a great question, Kenneth. I think that uh, better directed to the USGA, their championship committee and how they evaluate where to go. I think the fact that they've gone public versus private is a very good move. And I think that uh, the ability for them to host events on public facilities that have lots of land make it very easy for them to pull off a championship. So for uh, purposes that they decide where they go and why. Now, geographically, you know, they do look like they have uh, uh, the Opens on the West Coast this year, West Coast, it's on the East Coast. Then it's back to LA Country Club next year. Uh, back down, I think, to uh, Pinehurst. But it's, it goes back and forth across the country. And in the middle country, it will, uh, it will work as well. But they balance it between where they go public, private, and what area of the country, generally flipping back and forth. But... Uh, decision that they make. I think trying to stay in the arena of the old private clubs and courses with the type of history they have and the type of course that they have is really good. Uh, it's got great history that it's great for uh, uh, broadcasting uh, to have the type of history and things that they can fill in with when you go to a new course, uh, something like Chambers Bay. Uh, and I was with Trent Jones when they announced it back at the Houston uh, a USGA meeting and rode, uh, drove him, a matter of fact, up to a club north of there that he was consulting at and a friend of mine was a GM at and had a long time to talk about uh, uh, the type of development and what went on with, by, by awarding an amateur and an open to one site at one time. That's really a pretty big deal. And it's a public site, unproven, and they're really going to. That's really a pretty big deal. And, and uh, two great courses, Aaron Hills and, and Chambers Bay, and I'm sure they'll be going back to them. Uh, well, last question, question from John Sabino. Um, you talked about the Walker Cup briefly earlier, but um, has the Country Club uh, expressed much of an interest in uh, hosting the Walker Cup? John, another great question. Uh, we probably should have just left this as question and answer, and I'd give you more background and what goes on behind, for us anyway, we love the Walker Cup. What a great event. Uh, it is an incredible competition. There's a great deal that goes on outside of the competition itself that brings a community together for generations. And a lot of what you really don't see that goes on that really makes the Walker Cup a special event, not just the competition of amateurs, which is incredible. Uh, but to host one, it doesn't have the same impact on your facility uh, so that it's not as long, it's not as impactful. It's televised. It's a great event to host. It's amateur level golf, which is great. Uh, so for us hosting an, a Walker Cup, if the USGA walked in our door tomorrow and said we'd like to be able to host a Walker Cup soon, uh, we would be right there. Uh, supporting that effort. So we believe in it. It's a great event, but I think you'll find it going to smaller venues down the road. Yeah, I guess we have Seminole and Cypress coming up for the next couple in the U.S. So can you imagine uh, one, two better facilities and those two hosting a Walker yeah. Cup? It's going to be great. Right. Uh, one last question, which, which should be pretty quick from David. Uh, for the 2022 Open, when will you need to shut down the course before the event? Gosh, these are great questions. Uh, for us right now, contractually, we need to be off the course by the Wednesday preceding and allowing uh, uh, the USGA to have it for that five-day period. Uh, players can start coming. They can come in in the spring and play, but generally the course is available to them to play a week in advance so that we don't, we wouldn't have any member activity or things or limited member activity that might go on. What we have found by closing the course in advance of a championship, it allows the course to heal prior to going worldwide on television. So allowing a great deal of play to go up close to the championship is not a good thing. 
People want to, golfers want to be on there, but it's not good for the turf. You need to back off. And, and again, I would, I would just say when it comes to the superintendents and the jobs they do out there, it's incredible. You need to be able to allow them the opportunity to, to get to the turf, allow the turf to heal and get ready for a championship. So closing it early, if I had my druthers, I'd close it two weeks in advance. Uh, but uh, I probably get tarred and feathered for saying that within the club environment. Right. Well, David, thank you so much for all your insights and thank you to Paul for organizing. I uh, want to remind uh, all the attendees uh, to please uh, check out the MIT Alumni uh, Golf Association website and uh, you'll find on there, Ask Professor Paul uh, questions as well as information coming up soon about our second annual uh, tournament be bigger and better than last one with four months uh, and four rounds and monthly winners. So please uh, go to that website to stay uh, up to date on what we're doing in future events. But thank you so much for your time, David. Really, uh, really interesting talk. Thank you so much. It's been an honor to be part of it. Thank you all.